we'll be going over the cardiovascular system. Cardiovascular system is a closed system that consists of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. And closed means what's in there should stay in there and what's not in there should stay out of there. It's a two-sided pump that actually functions as one pump that delivers blood to the lungs for oxygenation and then returns back to the heart to the other side, the left side of the pump, to pump out to systemic circulation. Now the medium that we are actually pumping or moving throughout the body is blood that is formed from plasma and formed elements. You've got an average of about 5 liters of blood in, in an adult, about 70 milliliters per kilogram of blood for the average male, and about 65 milliliters per kilogram in the average female. Plasma is a straw colored liquid that, that makes up a little bit more than half of your blood volume. Plasma, pictured if you will, plasma is kind of the river that all the other stuff, like your albumin, your red blood cells, white blood cells, your chemical messengers, that they're all floating in. Now your next part that you're going to have are going to be your erythrocytes, or red blood cells. And these red blood cells carry an iron-containing protein called hemoglobin. And this is what oxygen is going to be bound to for transport throughout the whole body. Now your mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus which means that in that space where that nucleus would, have, would be, you now have room for hemoglobin. So this hemoglobin binds to your oxygen. Because they're kind of small with that little you know, disc-shaped shape, it lets them flow single file fairly easily through the capillaries where we can have that gas exchange. The typical lifespan of your red blood cell is about 120 days. And most of it usually is going to be broken down by the spleen and other places to, for reuse. Your white blood cells provide protection from invading antigens. And they also help support development of inflammatory response that's from an injury or infection. Your antigens are any foreign substance, usually some sort of protein, that produces an immune response. So pathogens, or otherwise things that you know produce organisms that produce a disease, are one source of these antigens. And also allergens and transplanted tissues and organs can also be sources of your antigens. Now the immune system can be kind of grossly divided into two different components, your innate and your adaptive. So your innate immune system re recognizes materials as either self or non-self and automatically responds and, qui and responds quickly to protect the body, but it's kind of like a, a hack and slash, if you will. It just goes out there and starts beating up on everything the exact same way it doesn't differentiate what it is beating up on. It's just self or not self. Now the adaptive system is going to use your B lymphocytes and your T lymphocytes and your antibodies. And this is a, a laser sharp tailored attack. So what this does is it says, hmm, I've met you before, figures out what that antigen's particular weakness is, and then knows exactly how to kill it. So it goes on a measured attack to figure out what to do about it. And your platelets are a small sm cell fragment set from that red blood cells that are being broken up, and they are uh, responsible for a part of the hemostasis, of hemostasis. Now don't confuse that with your homeostasis. Hemostasis means that we're keeping the blood intact, we're keeping our blood balance the way it's supposed to be. Remember that closed system. Now platelets circulate around in inactivated form until some chemical messenger activates it from an injury or blood loss of some sort. And when they get activated, these platelets are attracted to the site of injury and become sticky. And so they kind of form a plug together to stop this bleeding. And eventually you've got some other chemical messengers that come in and form a stable blood clot. In order to have proper blood clotting with these platelets, uh, you've got several different enzymes and vitamins and, and different factors that are required that are produced by the liver, and most of those are going to require vitamin K to function properly. Now your hematocrit, often seen abbreviated as your HCT, is percentage of volume of formed elements in the blood, the majority of which are going to be your red blood cells. So to obtain your hematocrit, a vial of blood is put through a centrifuge so the formed elements settle at the bottom. And this allows a measurement by percentage of volume. Your volume, the normal volume is a little bit lower in females than in males. Females typically run about 36 to 48 percent and males 42 to 52 percent. Another way of looking at the numbers of red blood cells is their number per cubic millimeter of blood, which is roughly 5 million. 
A high hematocrit indicates increased numbers of red blood cells, so this might be like chronic hypoxia or something like that, or a decreased plasma volume relative to the total normal red blood cells, such as dehydration. So just the concentration is a little bit stronger there. Now, if the body is hypoxic, the kidneys are going to increase your homo a hormone called erythropoietin that's going to act on the bone marrow to increase your production of red blood cells. So these patients who have chronic lung disease or live at higher altitudes where they, the air is a little thinner, these are going to result in your higher hematocrits, but it's also going to increase the overall oxygen carrying capabilities of the blood. So it's kind of a trade-off. Now your hemoglobin is a your hemoglobin is an essential component of that red blood cell because that's what actually binds to the red blood cell and binds to the oxygen to allow for transport. Now this bond between your oxygen and your hemoglobin is reversible, so there's a lot of different factors like we discussed in respiratory favoring your onloading of oxygen onto hemoglobin and others that favor the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. And one of those primary factors, as we discussed earlier, is going to be your blood partial pressure of oxygen. When that PaO2 is higher, more oxygen is unloaded. When it's lower, more oxygen is offloaded. Your proteins in the blood are going to determine your blood type. And most people are fairly familiar with A, B, AB, and O. And then of course the positive and the negative. So your antibodies are created within the body to attack cells of any other type other than your own. So this is why it's real important to do blood typing before you get a blood transfusion. For instance, if you have type A blood, so, well, let's back up a little bit. A cells have A antigens, B cells have B antigens, and AB have both A and B, and O have neither. So what that means is that your A recognizes A. So if it has anything other than A, it will go and attack it, okay, with that innate attack system from the white blood cell. So this means an A type A blood can get to blood from type A and it says, hey, you look familiar, you look like me, we're good. But if it gets blood from B, then it's going to recognize that B as an invader and it's going to attack it. Now A can also get blood from O because O doesn't have any of the antigens at all. So it doesn't trigger any alarms there. So your universal recipient for blood is going to be AB because they've got antigen, both antigens and they can take whichever blood and your universal donor is going to be O negative. Now the other, the negative or the positive part is going to be your RH factor and that just kind of adds another layer there and so you either have that factor or you don't. Once again, much like the O, if it's an R negative, RH negative factor, then they can give blood to whatever other antigens match up A or B. If it's positive, they can only give to a positive. O can give to negative or positive. Now we know that the heart's located in the mediastinum. We know it's hollow, it's got four chambers, essentially the whole two pumps that function as one pump. And we know that the blood flows through the heart. So the blood's going to come from the body in the vena cava, the inferior and superior vena cava. It's going to dump down into the right atrium. The right atrium's then going to flow through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And then that deoxygenated blood is going to go out the pulmonary arteries and it's going to go to the lungs. There we're going to have hopefully have gas exchange and then it's going to return to the left atrium from the pulmonary veins and then it's going to leave the left atrium to the left ventricle and then it will pump out of the left ventricle to the aorta and out throughout the whole body. Our heart muscle, <coughs> excuse me, our cardiac tissue consists of three different layers. So you have a thin inner endocardial lining that's going to coat the chambers and what this is going to do allow for very smooth blood flow so we don't have any regurgitation and increased risk of clots or anything. Then you're going to have a thick myocardial muscle layer and this is probably what you're most familiar with as far as a myocardial infarction or something like that, heart attack. This is where that usually takes place. And you've got an external epicardial layer that then you have an external epicardial layer that's going to form the visceral pericardium. The pericardium is going to be formed by a two-layered sac. It's going to have your inner layer. It's going to be the epicardium that's formed by the heart. And then your outer layer is the pericardium. And this is just a, a thick fibrous sheath that's going to cover the entire heart. And inside that, between the layers, you've got your pericardial fluid, much like your synovial fluid in your joints or your your serous fluid in your lungs, you're going to have, this is going to allow for that, that frictionless movement because that heart's com 
continuously moving within that sac. Now you have four major valves located within the, uh, within the heart that are gonna kind of direct the blood flow as these chambers contract. When the ventricles are gonna contract, the valves between the atrium and the ventricle keep the blood from being forced backwards into the atrium and allows it to go out through the pulmonary, arter the pulmonary artery and the aorta. The mitral valve or bicuspid valve sits between the left atrium and the left ventricle and the tricuspid valve sits between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And both of these valves are attached to papillary muscles called chordae tendinae. And these are just little bands that hold the valves in place and allow them to move and close as needed. Now after blood is pumped through the left ventricle into the aorta, the aortic semilunar valve closes to prevent blood from flowing back into the aorta from the left ventricle. And after that blood is pumped from the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries, the blood, the pulmonic or pulmonary semilunar valve is going to close to prevent blood flowing back into the right ventricle. Now, the heart is going to provide the circulation and pump the blood for the entire body, but it also needs its own blood supply for each individual cardiac cell. So this oxygenated blood is delivered to the myocardium by your coronary arteries. It's really kind of a cool system because they, they've set it up so that in every beat of the heart, the blood gets its own oxygen supply. So what happens is you get this aortic valve that opens during ventricular systole or contraction. Okay, and that kind of covers the entrance to the coronary arteries, the sinus there, the coronary sinus. Once it's completed, it's systole during diastole, that aortic valve is gonna close. And well, not all of that blood's gonna make it up over that aortic arch. So some of it's gonna drain back down, and then it's going to enter the coronary arteries during that diastole. You've got your right and left main coronary arteries that are gonna emerge from the aorta. Your left coronary artery and its branches supply the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the intraventricular septum. The right coronary and, it, and its branches are gonna supply the right atrium and portions of both ventricles. The left main quickly bifurcates into the left anterior descending that supplies blood to the left ventricle and to the intraventricular septum and the circumflex artery, which also supplies the left ventricle. The right coronary artery is going to supply your right ventricle and then later gives to the posterior descending artery, which is going to provide blood, blood supply to the inferior wall of the heart. Your SA and AV nodes that we'll discuss in a different segment are supplied by the right coronary artery in most people. Current of this blood is provided by the coronary sinus, which is an opening in the right atrium that's going to return your deoxygenated blood that's draining from these coronary veins. Your vascular system is collectively known as vasculature, and there are three main types. You've got your arteries, your veins, and your capillaries. Your arteries are going to be your thicker walled vessels, and they're going to have the high pressure system. So they're going to have the high pr blood pressure leaving the heart. Because of this, they are designed, the walls of the arteries are constructed with three layers called tunics. And the tunica intima, or tunica in interna, is the smooth inner lining that's made up of epithelial cells. This is going to allow your blood to flow with minimal friction throughout the vessel. Your tunica media is a thicker middle layer, and this is going to have some elastic tissue, but also muscle, depending on the size of that vessel. For instance, your aorta is a much larger vessel, and whether it is large and fairly elastic, it does not constrict very well, if at all. Now, your arterioles, which are the smallest arteries, have a pretty substantial layer of your smooth muscle there, so they can constrict quite readily. And this is what we would see during, say, our shock, where we have uh, peripheral shunting. The smooth muscles of the arteries and the veins both have alpha-1 receptors, which is going to be your receptor for your epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is going to cause that smooth muscle to constrict. Now the tunica external, externa, or the tunica adventitia, is the outer layer, and this is more of a collagen connective tissue that's just going to provide your strength and your stability for these vessels. In most cases, your arteries have oxygenated blood. Uh, the one exception to this is going to be your pulmonary artery, which is going to pump deoxygenated blood. Your capillaries are going to be your tiny little vessels that are going through the tissues providing cells with a way to exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, and getting nutrients and other substances. These walls are one cell thick, 
which means those red blood cells can easily go in and out throughout the capillaries and exchange this gas as needed. Now your veins are going to carry lower pressure blood, so they are going to be a lot thinner than the arteries, but they still have the same three layers. All right, so they're going to get their blood from the capillary beds, which is going to dump into successively larger veins until it finally makes its way back to the heart. Once again, your veins are going to carry your deoxygenated blood, except for the pulmonary veins, which are going to bring oxygenated blood back from the lungs to the left atrium. Now, because this venous pressure is low and the blood is traveling against gravity, it's got two built-in features that kind of help blood get back to the heart. So the first one is the one-way valves. And these, think of these as kind of like a lock and dam system, and they're going to prevent that blood from draining back down when we are standing up or moving or, or standing up, when we are standing up. Now the second one, blood in the lower extremities is assisted and gets movement back by the contractions of the skeletal muscles. So by moving around, we actually help that blood flow return back to the heart. And this is real important. If you've ever seen somebody, you've ever, ever been told, don't lock your knees, or if you've seen somebody standing at attention for a, a fair amount of time, prolonged amount of time, what's happening there when they pass out, you're not moving. So that absence of that skeletal muscle movement decreases the blood returning back to the heart. When that decreased preload happens, then decreased cardiac output, and then under that lower pressure, not enough blood's getting to the brain. And so then the brain stops functioning properly and then you collapse. Well then, we're hopefully at an equal level so the brain doesn't have to overcome gravity anymore we regain consciousness. Now the blood vessels are arranged in two main circuits, if you will, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So the pulmonary starts with the pulmonary artery at the right ventricle and then goes into the left and right pulmonary arteries that are going to carry that deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs where we're going to go into the capillaries that are surrounding the alveoli. Once it's oxygenated, then it's going to dump back into the pulmonary veins that converge to bring that oxygenated blood to the left to the left atrium. Now your systemic circulation begins at the aorta, and this is going to get blood from the left ventricle, and then it's going to go through the aortic arch and then into the descending aorta. And then your larger order arteries are going to begin to branch off. If you look here, you can see where you have your subclavian arteries. They're going to run beneath your clavicles. And these are going to branch into your arteries of the upper extremities, your internal carotids, your vertebral arteries. These are going to be, have your blood supply for your brain. Your external carotid arteries are going to provide blood to your scalp and to your face. The brachial arteries can be felt along the anterior surface of the elbow in the antecubital fossa. And the radial artery can be felt on the anterior portion of the wrist at the base of the thumb. The descending aorta is divided up into the thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta. And you've got a lot of different branches that break off, providing your blood flow to the trunk. And then the aorta is going to bifurcate about L4 to form the right and left common iliac arteries. You can feel the femoral artery in the groin. The popliteal is going to run behind the knee. The dorsal pedis is going to be felt at the dorsum of the foot, and the posterior tibial will be found just posterior to the tibial tuberosity on the inside portion of the ankle. Now, as far as the smaller veins, you know, as you as you start your IVs, you, you figure out they're somewhat variable. They may be supposed to be there, but they may be a little bit off. So, generally, though, they'll be somewhat more consistent as they turn into the larger veins and start to merge into the larger ones. The veins of the upper extremities, your head, your neck, all double up to the subclavian veins, which is the superior vena cava, and the veins of your trunk and lower extremities are going to empty into the inferior vena cava. Now there is one real important kind of side mission for the systemic circulation, and that's called the hepatic portal circulation. So what this is, the GI tract, is getting all, a lot of your blood, a substantial portion of your blood supply normal, under normal circumstances, and it's going to be absorbing the nutrients that are ingested through this GI tract. Now, instead of directly returning back to the systemic circulation for recirculation of these nutrients, the blood is first going to travel to the hepatic portal vein to the liver, where it's going to enter a second capillary bed. Here, the liver cells are going to remove the toxins and the nutrients and everything from the blood before it's returned back to the hepatic vein where it empties into the inferior vena cava. And so this is just a way to allow us to break down and make available different substances and to protect our body from certain toxins.